Hello everyone and welcome back to Bio 181. In this lecture we'll discuss cellular respiration. In a sense, this image represents all of our beginnings. A newly fertilized egg called a zygote. The two circles within are the pronuclei of the sperm and egg unifying. Every person started off as a single cell just like this. The average adult human body consists of 37 trillion cells, all of which propagated from a single zygote. This process perfectly obeys cell theory, which states that all cells currently on Earth originated from prior cells. That cell split into two cells, then four, and so on and so on, until a human body takes shape and forms. Through a variety of biological processes, cells begin to take on unique roles, such as forming into heart cells, skin cells, and brain cells. Cell replication and specialization is not only important for the development of multicellular organisms, but also for the repair and replacement of old cells. In fact, scientists estimate that it takes on average seven years for every cell in your body to be cycled out with new ones. No cell that makes up your body today was there about seven years ago. And every seven years, you are a completely new person in terms of your cellular composition. Cell reproduction is focused on the processes of one of the tenets of cell theory we have discussed. That is, all cells come from pre-existing cells. Before cells embark on cellular division, they must first replicate essential cellular components so that the new cells are equipped to survive. One of these essential components are their genetic blueprint, DNA. Because of the central role DNA plays in essential processes and its importance in the different phases of replication, we are going to take a moment to cover some bare bones facts of DNA. DNA like, DNA, like RNA, is a type of nucleic acid that is made up of nucleotides. All nucleotides are monomers made up of a phosphate, a sugar, which would be deoxyribose in the case of DNA, or ribose in the case of RNA, and a nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous bases of DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine and they are abbreviated A, T, G, and C. In this image, we can see a strand of DNA. Imagine the phosphates, which are interjected with riboses, as the backbone of the strand, and the nitrogenous bases hang attached to the strand by a nitrogen-carbon bond to the ribose sugar. Look more carefully at the deoxyribose sugar. Each point in the ribose is a location of a carbon, and each carbon is numbered, starting with the one bound to the nitrogenous base, moving clockwise to the last one that is bound to a phosphate. Look at the very top of the structure, and you will see a five prime and a red box. This means that the phosphate on this end is bound to the fifth carbon of ribose. At the very bottom in the first strand is a three prime in a red box. That means that this end of the strand is where we would attach a phosphate to the third carbon. In a sense, DNA has a direction to it, just like driving down a one-way street would. Now, We'll discuss what complementary strands means, but basically it's the combination of two different strands through hydrogen bonds, where one strand reflects what the other strand has as, as its sequence because of the type of chemical reactions that need to take place. So A nitrogenous bases will always bind the T nitrogenous bases, and C nitrogenous bases will always bind to G nitrogenous bases, and that makes them complementary. Here is a general depiction of that structure. 
Look at figure B first. Here we can see both strands connected together. The blue ribbons are representative of the phosphoribose backbone. The red, purple, yellow, and green bars represent the nitrogenous bases. Figure B shows the double-stranded DNA flattened out. However, DNA twists around itself, making the shape of a double helix. Imagine this like a twisted staircase, with the nitrogenous bases hydrogen bonded to each other, represented the steps of the staircase, and the sugar phosphate backbone representing the banisters. The language or code of DNA is written in the sequence of the A's, T's, G's, and C's of the DNA. The structural organization of DNA is an important component to cellular replication. You've heard your DNA discussed in terms of your chromosomes. The chromosome is a single long double strand of DNA. In the analogy of the letters of the code representing language, then chromosomes would be the books of the cell. The number and types of chromosomes will vary between different organisms, and the collection could be thought of as a library. Eukaryotic cells have their DNA stored within a nucleus, while prokaryotes do not. Instead, they have a localized region where the DNA is kept called a nucleoid region. We will see that this difference will be very important when the cell is replicating DNA, dividing and packaging its DNA. The distinction here that is important is between the existence of a nucleus versus no nucleus. Let's dig in a bit more on the structural differences between the two. Prokaryotes have a circular chromosome in their nucleoid region, meaning that there is no technical end or finish, but a closed loop. Prokaryotes may have many copies of this chromosome, or just a single copy, like owning many copies of the same book. Additionally, prokaryotes also often contain smaller circular pieces of DNA called plasmids that are like addendums to the chrom chromosome. Prokaryotes replicate through a method called binary fission. The circular chromosomes must be replicated and localized to different sides of the cell. In this process, one parental cell produces two nearly identical cells. The part of the process where the cells rather than the components of cells, divides into two, called cytokinesis. Cyto meaning cell, and kinesis meaning movement. And the byproduct of which are two basically identical daughter cells. Eukaryotic cells are not, or eukaryotic cells DNA is not circular. It exists as linear DNA coiled around proteins called histones that help to package and condense the DNA. To the right, we see an unpackaged DNA double helix. This DNA, which would otherwise be loose and free floating, is bound and wrapped around histone proteins seen beside it. This packaging is collectively called a nucleosome. These then form coils, which then form coils on themselves. This is kind of like a core that gets twisted, and then if you over twist it, it folds back on itself to form twists on top of twists. If you've ever handled a phone line before, sometimes when the cord gets twisted too much, then it forms another coil on top of itself. That's very similar to that. And this leads to a highly condensed form of DNA that gives the shape on the far left that we may have seen before, the chromosome. Let's broadly examine the parts of a chromosome in eukaryotes. In the middle is what's called a centromere, where the chromosome may, can be tethered to or moved around the cell width. To either side, the top or the bottom, is called the P-arm and the Q-arm. One arm is shorter than the other, and the P-arm is the smaller 
and the Q-arm is the larger one. Most eukaryotes, such as humans, have two copies of each chromosome, two copies of each book, one from each parent. Because of this, they are described as diploid. Di from the root word to, employed, meaning chromosomes. Eukaryotes can have anywhere from 1 to 720 pairs of chromosomes or different pairs of books. The naming is a bit confusing. Diploid is the most common number. So that's, you know, the, 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 um, basically the default number of copies of a single chromosome. So therefore, haploid cells have only one copy of each chromosome instead of a pair. And this comes from the root word haplo, which means half. So it is half a diploid set. The ants Myrmecia pilosula has one pair of chromosomes, and the fern Ophioglossum reticulatum, kind of hard to say there, has 630 pairs of chromosomes. So 630 different books, all with, with a copy of each, two copies of each. And here we have an example of a human karyotype. And humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And since they're pairs, the total number of chromosomes counted up, if you counted all the numbers in here, would equal 46. This would be like owning 23 different books and two different editions of each book, one from each parent. Okay. So again, humans are diploid. So each unique chromosome or book in our analogy has two copies to make a pair of books. We specifically have 23 pairs of unique books or 23 pairs of unique chromosomes for a total of 46 books altogether or total chromosomes in our library. A visual display of our chromosomes is called a karyotype. So in, the, in this uh, black box, you see the karyotype listed here. In the red box, you will see highlighted the sex chromosomes, which you should be familiar with as the chromosomes called X and Y. These chromosomes largely determine the biological sex of an individual. Each unique chromosome harbors its own set of different instructions. Humans have 23 different chromosomes. And so we could have 23 different chromosomes that we need to be able to distinguish between. And so here's an example of a, uh, of a a gene located on a chromosome. Uh, it's found on chromosome four, and it contains information for making the protein alpha synuclein. And alpha synuclein is found in the brain and nerve cells throughout the body. Mutations in this segment of DNA are part of the cause of Parkinson's disease. So geneticists have a way of signifying the area for each instruction. For example, the alpha synuclein protein gene is found on the fourth chromosome, the Q arm, at location 22.1. Remember that each chromosome is diploid. One copy will have came from your mother and one from your father. These are called homologous chromosomes. The location for each instruction will be in the same location for homologous chromosomes. However, the exact directions may be slightly different. So the alpha synuclein protein made from one homologous chromosome may not be exact, be an exact match from the other. Just like if you had two books of the, if two copies of the same book that were written down, um, they might not have been transcribed perfectly and might not have all of the exact same letters there, but they are two copies of the same book, and that is a homologous chromosome.
The instructions may work perfectly well in one homologous chromosome, but the other one that's inherited from another parent may be defective. In this example, having a defective alpha synuclein protein may put a person at risk for Parkinson's disease. And this brings us to checkpoint one. Humans are blank organisms with blank chromosomes. Each pair are called blank chromosomes and contain the same instructions with slight variations. To understand chromosomal replication on eukaryotes, let's look at their overall cell replication. This replication can be broken down into several steps. G1, S, G2, and then M and C. Steps G1, S, and G2 are called interphase. G1 is the first phase of interphase and occurs just after cytokinesis, so just after two new cells form. Cells are conducting, in this phase, normal cellular processes like growing in size, synthesizing different parts of the cell, and other general metabolism. If the cell is capable of progressing to S phase, this is the step where the cell will duplicate the genome and organelles, parts of the cell essential to having multiple copies or before dividing into two separate cells. To do this, the cell makes copies of each homologous chromosome. These newly formed arms are all still attached at the centromere. These chromosomes are called sister chromatids. It is critical that you recognize that we still have the exact same number of homologous chromosomes, but they have turned themselves into sister chromatids by replicating their P and Q arms. These sister chromatids are replicates of each other. Keep tally of this. The cell started with two homologous chromosomes, seen on the left. Another way of saying this is one pair of chromosomes. And after replication of the chromosomes, nothing changed with the number of homologous chromosomes. We just created, after replication, sister chromatids. And if we would, and if we count each one of up, we get a total of four sister chromatids. Two for the mother's homologous chromosome and two for the father's homologous chromosome. But there's still, if you look at the if you look at the right side image at the top, you see in brackets that there's two homologous chromosomes, the purple one and the green one. And look at the bottom. There's four sister chromatids, two, two blue or purple ones, and two green ones. Okay, these karyotypes show what the cell's chromosomal structure would appear as before the S phase. And after S phase, when the sister chromatids are formed on the left and then the right side. Now, all of the DNA has been duplicated on the image on the right side. And while the cell has further processing to get to these sister chromatids being separated, the cell has completed replication of their DNA. Point two, domestic dogs have 39 pairs of chromosomes. How many total chromosomes do, they, do their cell, cells have? Point three, domestic dogs have 39 pairs of chromosomes. After S phase, how many total sister chromatids do their cells have? This brings us to the G2 phase, where cells wrap up finishing uh, tasks that are involved with growing. So they're going to, they've already replicated their DNA. Now they just need to tidy up some tasks there, finish growing so that they're capable of breaking and turning into two separate cells. And, and this is the final interphase step. So we see interphase is made up of G1, S, and G2. The cells are now ready to enter the M phase. 
The M phase involves further DNA processing in the prophase, metaphase, and anaphase. C phase is the last step in which cell division occurs and is considered a subset of M phase. During M phase, mitosis occurs. Here, cells divvy up copies of their DNA into two identical nuclei. Okay, so here the cells divide its replicated chromosomes into two identical sets and two new nuclei. We can generalize it into distinct phenotypes of the cell, the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase, and cytokinesis are considered part of mitosis. And they're gonna look like this. Here's the interphase, the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase and cytokinesis. And they'll actually be observable under a microscope, um, these very distinct um, appearances of the way the chromosome is packaged and unpackaged and moved across the cell. And please do not go to these links for the exam. Um, you know, tattoos are permanent, folks. Late in the interphase, the cell has a single intact nucleus containing two copies of DNA. DNA is not wound into neat chromosomes at this point and is called chromatin in this state. The structure of DNA changes rapidly in mitosis. Observe the cells with the nucleus in the center. Phase one is prophase, and the, this condenses the chromatin into chromosome form. The nuclear envelope breaks down, shown by the perforated green encircling the chromosomes, and represented by orange rectangles on the sides of the cell and blue fibers protruding from them, structures called centrioles begin to build the spindle fibers and stretch them across the cell. And this leads to the chromosomes attaching to the spindle fibers at the kinetic ore, which is in the middle of the chromosome, which we uh, refer to as the centromere before, but now the kinetic ore. In these short clips, we can see the chromosomes condense into their sister chromatid forms and the nuclear membrane dissociating, leaving the sister chromatids and their kinetic ores in the middle exposed to the spindle fibers. In mitosis phase two, metaphase, the chromosomes change their position and line up at the equator of the cell while attached to the spindle fibers. So the spindle fibers are going to direct the chromosomes where to go. So at first they line them up in the at the equator. And here we see an am, animation to uh, demonstrate that process taking place here. And observe the lining up of the sister chromatids along the equator of the cell with the spindle fibers reaching out and attaching to the kinetic ores. Okay, mitosis phase three. In anaphase, the kinetic core finally breaks down and the sister chromatids are pulled apart to opposite ends by the spindle fibers so that now each side has a complete set of homologous chromosomes. And here this animation is gonna show the separating of the kinetic core, the spindle fibers pulling them into different ends of the cell. And here's a microscopy image of them being ripped apart. Beautiful. Mitophase four, or mitosis phase four, telophase. In telophase, these two regions of the cell begin to revert back to a chromatin form. 
a nuclear envelope takes shape around them. The spindle fibers are dissociated, and now the cell has two identical nuclei. as can be seen here. And in the microscopy image, all that is left to do is cytokinesis, where this cell splits into two creating two cells from one. In cytokinesis, cells split themselves into two, creating a set of what are called daughter cells. In animal cells, this is done with a contractile ring, which is made of cytoskeleton filaments and pinches the cell in two. In plant vessels, from the Golgi apparatus, carry cell wall materials to the equator and fuse to form a cell plate, leading to the creation of two distinct cells. Okay, now let's take a moment to watch some video of this in action here. Okay, so now we see basically a prophase occurring here. Cells are being condensing their chromosomes. And we're slowly moving into metaphase where they're lining up against the axial plate and separating an anaphase. Beautiful. And telophase is occurring. It's breaking down the chromatin there. Here again, here we are at the metaphase. That's anaphase of multiple cells. Uh huh. Prophase, metaphase, uh huh. Spindle fibers attaching, and anaphase pulling them apart, the sister chromatids. And there we go with telophase, two new nuclei. And here we are with checkpoint four. What phase of mitosis does this depict? Checkpoint five, what phase of mitosis does this depict? Checkpoint six. What would be the result of daughter cells if a daughter cell if a cell did not complete S phase properly? Okay, so that covers the cell phases. Now let's talk about how uh, cells control uh, the different cell cycles. So to ensure that the cell is completing its tasks properly before it goes on to the next step, a series of checkpoint controls the cell cycle. The G1 checkpoint occurs in the late G1 phase. The cell is looking to see if conditions are favorable for cell division to proceed. The cell will check for DNA damage, adequate cell size, adequate nutritional stores, growth factors. Cells that fail the checkpoint will be diverted into the G0 phase in which they stay dormant. Cells will either eventually succeed where they can pass the checkpoint, lie dormant, and possibly never divide at all. The G2 checkpoint occurs in late G2 phase. The cell will confirm if conditions are right to undergo mitosis. Therefore, since this is past the S phase and at the end of G2, the cell will check for the presence of all chromosomes, DNA damage, and adequate cell size. The M checkpoint occurs during mitosis at the end of metaphase. The cell will be checking if conditions are right to proceed with anaphase. The cell will check for 
proper attachment of all chromosomes to the spindle fibers. These checkpoints are coordinated by a variety of proteins. For example, P53 checks for DNA damage for the G1 checkpoint and will halt the cell cycle if detected. It will recruit other proteins to fix the damage or initiate cell suicide, named apoptosis, if damage cannot be repaired, in order to pre prevent such a sick cell from reproducing. Retinoblastoma protein is another which checks for adequate cell size in G1 checkpoint and blocks progression to S phase until sufficient cell size has been reached. Cancer is uncontrolled and abnormal cell growth, and P53 retinoblastoma protein and others involved in cell cycle checkpoints are considered tumor suppressor proteins because they help regulate cellular growth by arresting the cell cycles until a cell is restored to normal parameters at a particular stage. And if this cannot occur, will lead it to apoptosis, which is defined as programmed cell death. A mutated P53 gene may not be able to have this protective effect and can therefore let cancer take hold within an organism. Mutated P53 genes have been identified in more than 50% of all human tumor cells. There are thousands of genes that are involved in cell cycle regulation. Every case of cancer is caused by a different set of mutations, making its treatment not only difficult because they are our own cells causing the disease, but, but also they are very similar enough and so it's difficult to have a single solution for each and every case because the small similarities are can, be, can sometimes be difficult to distinguish through the use of drugs. Checkpoint seven, label the following on the figure at the left. Chromatin, P-arm, Q-arm, centromere, sister chromatid, and chromosome. Checkpoint eight. Would this chromosome exist before or after S phase? And checkpoint nine, lamin A is a signaling protein embedded in the cell membrane. The locus of the lamin A gene is 1Q22, on which human chromosome arm and position can the recipe for this protein be found? And that is the end of this chapter. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you for the next one.